we'll have future generations to reflect on. Okay, uh, well, welcome to our seminar slash webinar today. Uh, glad that you're being a part of Centralized. Uh, I'm Ursula Harrison. I'm a supplemental faculty member at Central Seminary and uh, also work with Pinnacle Leadership Associates as the coaching team leader and uh, liaison for the uh, Reshaping Church uh, emphasis that is funded by the Lilly Endowment. Uh, and uh, Angela was the original uh, director of that work and now Jessica is working with that. Uh, I'm gonna introduce our primary presenter today. It's uh, Mark Tisworth. Mark is the uh, team leader for Pinnacle Leadership Associates. Mark, uh, Mark actually was my pastor at one time in a, a new church plant and uh, then became a marriage and family therapist. He helped to uh, create the Center for Clergy and Congregations with uh, South Carolina's Baptist Health System. And then in 2008, launched Pinnacle Leadership Associates and uh, actually invited me to come on board as an associate at that time. Mark uh, is a, uh, an author. He's written several books, including Shift. He's written uh, Farming Church and then uh, Reshape, and then some other uh, publications as well. Mark, uh, Mark brings a unique insight to what's happening in the church in the 21st century. He's a good person at spotting trends and identifying ways that we can uh, engage in adaptive change as uh, the church in the 21st century. I'm admitting someone at the moment. Okay. So um, it's interesting as we... Uh, as we mentioned uh, prior to the recording starting, we uh, the Pinnacle began working with Central on the uh, on the Thriving in Congregations Initiative in uh, I guess really 2019, and then we started planning. And uh, Mark and I went out and met with Jessica and Angie. We believe in that same room where the group at the seminary is located right now in February. 2008 to 2020 excuse me and uh, we started planning on well, a lot of things that we were going to do we're using a, a adaptive change process called farming church helping churches to get ready for adaptive change and uh, we had a lot of plans including i think a nice seaside retreat we were going to do somewhere on the atlantic coast and uh, a couple of months later everything went down the drain and we had to uh, engage in adaptive change pretty quickly. And out of that came the reshaping church process. We've been doing this with churches for uh, two years now and continue to find ways to innovate in how that applies in local church situations. So although you have a particular description in the program of what Mark is going to talk about today, uh, it's going to be different because we are shifting. We are looking at a different way of presenting where the church is right now. So I'm glad Mark with us today to present. We'll have, he'll do a presentation, we'll have discussion, and then uh, we'll wrap up talking about where we are going forward with the reshaping church process. So Mark, thank you for being part of this meeting today. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me ask you a question, Ursula. Do you happen to have the PowerPoint pulled up? I do. Let's bring that okay. up. Okay. Um, and if, Maybe if you'll make me a co-host, then um, I could just advance it when we get ready here. Yeah, I don't know if you can or not, but we'll. I don't uh, think so. Okay, well that's all right. Just just give me the high sign when the time is to. All to, right. I would say that this is a. Here's a picture of some of the folks that have been involved in reshaping church 2022, and uh, uh, we have had churches in in Kansas, in Wisconsin. Uh, in uh, Indiana, and so good, uh, good representation of the the people who have been involved in reshaping church this year. Well, if you all don't mind, it, well, first of all, it's great to see you. Thank you for joining us in this workshop and being here online or in person. I guess we all are literally in person with ourselves. If with no one else, we're always in person, but some of us are showing up online and some uh, in the classroom there at Central Seminary. If you don't mind, let's take a moment 
and invite you to introduce yourself. I'd be curious about your name and where you live, where you are, and uh, where you're serving these days, what kind of serving you're doing is a way to help us to uh, know one another. You all might know one another, but I suspect not everybody does, and uh, I don't either. So how about we start with people on the screen, and I'll call on someone, and then you just hand the mic to another person on the screen, and then we'll get to the, the classroom. So I saw Tony show up first. I'll hand the mic to her. All right. Um, I'm Tony Page. I am a fourth year uh, MDiv student, also doing the uh, graduate certificate in peace and justice. I am in the Kansas City area and I work for Central. And uh, my ministry area right now is, is I'm an intern at my, at my church. And I am also doing a um, contextual learning at a dinner church. Uh, here in town as well, called the Open Table. So um, keeping me busy. Great. Do you want to pass the mic? I'm going to pass the mic to Jeannie because I don't know Jeannie. Well, um, I'm Jeannie Bridgewater, and I'm a graduate of Sem uh, Central Seminary in '87. Um, my husband and I uh, serve a church, a small rural church. Bethel Baptist of Leota, which is about five miles out of uh, Scottsburg, Indiana. And um, most recently, I become a spiritual director and our church is starting a, a spiritual formation and counseling center. And I'm Jessica Chadwick, or Williams' aunt. Cool. Oh. How about Janet? Good morning. I'm Janet Pace from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I am the Vice President of Development and Philanthropy for the Greater Baton Rouge Food Bank. I'm also a, in four weeks, we'll be done with my MDiv. Not that I'm counting. <laughs> Congratulations. Yay. <laughs> That's great. Well, let's go to our classroom there. So I'm Carolyn uh, Predmore. I live in Stillwell, Kansas, which is just south of Kansas City. Uh, I'm a graduate of Central two times, 1966. Most of you, some of you may have not have been born then, and 2001. Uh, and I am retired, so my ministry is retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> uh, my name is Nai Tang. I am a student of uh, Santa Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, now I study the mean course. I almost finished coursework for <laughs> 10 years. Thank <laughs> you. I live in uh, Kansas. And Nai Tong is here from Myanmar, has come to, to study here and be here for a couple of years until his degree is finished. So I'm Angie Jackson. Uh, I'm a two-time graduate of Central MDiv 2014, DMIN 2018. And my ministry is um, uh, development work, fundraising for uh, Central. Great. Well, what a, did, it, did that give everyone an opportunity? Good. What a great uh, diverse group of people here. So uh, with lots of different ministry settings and contexts. So uh, thank you for, for joining us. Um, what we're gonna do is uh, I'll, I'll talk some and describe some things. But let's make this interactional and dialogical as we go. And I will pause and ask you some specific questions. But if you have a question and or an insight as we go, just jump right in and uh, get my attention. And we would be glad to hear that as we're going along. So um, we were using the five active dynamics 
present in most churches as a way to introduce reshaping church. Uh, and that seemed to be very helpful. Uh, but now we we have updated that to where we are describing the current situation because those five active dynamics have changed somewhat with time and with adaptation and we're at a new place. And so what I'd like to do is describe the current situation and um, there's some really good research that's coming out, and I, I don't think I included slides on that, but I can tell you about some of that as we go, and anecdotal uh, observations. So uh, hopefully this will be a really good, rich learning experience and conversation opportunity for us. So first of all, how about that next slide? Before we jump into the current situation, having done lots of coaching with clergy and church staff people and working with lay leaders in churches. I've learned it's really helpful to remind us of why we are in this. Given everything that's happened in our world the last few years, it is good for us to return to our foundations and I, I like to say it this way, living in the way of Jesus is a beautiful way to be in the world. When we can get ourselves there and we enter the flow of God's movement in the world and we wade into the energy that is God's energy, I'm remembering, remembering Psalm 46, there's a river who makes glad uh, the city of God. So visualize a, uh, an arid environment, Jerusalem, the holy city, water is precious and is life-giving, and there's a river, a stream flowing through it. There's a river whose stream makes glad the city of God. If we were to translate it for us, makes glad the people of God. That, that, that stream is ongoing and is flowing and it is life-giving. Uh, the scriptures describe it with all these metaphors in the New Testament, like the pearl of great price or the treasure in the field, that when people discover it, they'll do almost anything to be able to participate with it and to be a part of it. So the way of Jesus, using that phrase from the book of Acts, where they weren't quite sure how to talk about it, it was, it was this emerging way of uh, spiritual activity in the world. Uh, it was not a major world religion at that time. It was just the beginnings of the spiritual movement. Those people who are Jesus people or, or who live in the way, and they weren't quite sure how to talk about it. But the way they talked about it, you could tell it's a way of life. It, it's far more than uh, simply practicing a religion at certain times. It's a way of being and life. And so when living in the way of Jesus is a hopeful, life-giving, beautiful way to be. And for us, many of us have been resensitized to the fact that it helps us stay grounded when there's great volatility in the world. There's some things that do not change. And the way of Jesus is something that we can count on and put our feet down on and uh, keeps us centered. So I simply wanted to remind us of that, and it's going to be relevant to what we talk about, because this is why we're in this in the first place. This is, this is what it's all about. Next slide, Ursula. So with that in mind, let's move to two observations. And the first one has an introduction to it. The introduction is that volatility High levels of volatility always bring change with them. Uh, our, our choices are not whether change will happen, it's how we want to relate to the change that is happening. Are you all, you all, has everybody heard the phrase, the great resignation? Wave your hand saying yes if you have. Oh, good, thank you. That, that's how we do audience participation on our Zoom meeting today. Thank you for that way. Well, 
I looked and discovered Anthony Klotz is the one who coined that term, and you may know this already. He's an organizational psychologist at Texas A&M and studies organizational trends and the workplace especially. And he's the one who observed people changing jobs, changing vocations, changing positions, or simply resigning their job without a place to go during the pandemic and post pandemic. And I can tell you, um, you probably know people who have done this. I, we know a family who lives near us where both of the adults are school teachers. We are talking to them and they were saying, describing how many teachers they've lost in their school. Just, just huge numbers. Mm -hmm. um, pick any vocation, it's happening. But so that's happening vocational. I love what Anthony Klotz has said. Let me read this aloud for us. From organizational research, we know that when human beings come into contact with death and illness in their lives, it causes them to take a step back and ask existential questions like, what gives me purpose and happiness in life? And does that match up with how I'm spending my right now? So in many cases, these reflections will lead to life pivots. I like his, his phrase, does that match up with how I'm living my right now? So um, let's go to the next slide, Ursul. What, what we're doing is recognizing the great resignation is happening, but I think Anthony Klotz was, was very insightful in seeing this, but it's not limited to vocations. It's not limited to the work world. I am calling it at this point, the great reevaluation. It's, it's like every area in our lives. People are evaluating every area. Work is one, but also personal relationships, um, where they live, uh, the community that they're part of. I hear pastors talking about all the time that they have people from their church who started working remotely during the pandemic and discovered they could continue doing that and they moved to somewhere else uh, and they had the same job. They didn't transfer jobs, they just moved because they could. So it's affecting where we live, how we do everything. The, the volatility in our world brought us to some crisis points and people are reevaluating everything. In some ways, we in churches hoped, hoped we might escape that phenomenon, but we did not. People are also reevaluating their faith, and they're reevaluating their relationship with their church. Hartford um, Seminary, now I think it's called Hartford International University. They recently changed their name. Right. They have been Hartford Seminary for a long time but they have uh, some Lilly funding too, just like Central Seminary does. Uh, and they've been able to do some long-term studies of congregations. Uh, they have one that started back in 2000. And every five years, they come out with a report about congregational life. Uh, so this gives them a wealth of information where they've been tracking congregations. And I was in one of their seminars in April, online seminar about post-pandemic life. So because they've been tracking it for a long time and they, they are able to do uh, recent surveys, this comes from a survey of 15,278 churches. So it, it's huge, it's, that's large, obviously. All different denominations uh, in the United States of America, 15,278. Look at what they discovered about volunteering. Before the pandemic, those churches in their survey were reporting that 44% of their people were serving in their church or in the community in a missional ministry that the church was involved with. So 44%, of course, we wish the percentage was 60 or 70 or 80%. You know, hopefully we want it to rise, but that's what they were saying. The leaders of churches were reporting in this survey. Now, after the pandemic, that percentage 
has moved from 44 to 20%. Wow. That, there are not a lot of statistics that are bombshell statistics, but I think this is one of them. This is, that's a dramatic change. Uh, as you, you, you know math, that, that's less than half, 44 to 20. Uh, so let me ask you all a question. Uh, Ursula, if you don't mind, stop sharing for just a moment and um, wanna ask you all a question. Of course, with research like this, it doesn't apply to every church the same. There's a lot of variation within churches. So, so this is the average response they received from 15,278. So your church may not be exactly the same as this, but it does give us a reference point. So let me ask you this question. If this is so, that half, of, half as many people in a church are willing to serve in a position, they're, they're volunteering, uh, whether it's in an ongoing position or just for an event or whatever, where do you think, how do you think that's affecting churches? How's that playing out in churches? Where do you see that dynamic influencing the life of churches so far? So uh, just if you have an insight on that or a thought, speak up if you're in the classroom or take yourself off mute if you're online. Where do you think the impact is of this or where are you seeing the impact of this? Well, I can give some observations about my own church or home church. It, it is an aging church. And since the pandemic, a lot of the younger people have not come back. And what is happening in the church is one, it's getting harder to fill kind of those, even the teaching positions in the Sunday schools, you know, those kinds of things, having to now combine classes that we didn't used to have to combine. And, um, you know, people just say they're uh, the ones who are left, you hear that they're tired, they're tired. And so they're reevaluating, if you will, their own commitment. And I think where it's impacting most is, you know, what can we do beyond our own four walls? You know, are we just going to be worried about maintaining what we can inside the church? We do have some, a do, we do have a younger group that really leads the mission committee. So they're trying to do some new and different things. So there's hope there. But yeah, we're in a we're in a pretty tough place right now. Thank you, Janet. And Mark, I'll respond uh, from the church where I'm a member. We we lost uh, we lost a number of people because we didn't not come back soon enough from the pandemic, and uh, that included a number of um, kind of mid I say median age young adults and families. But one of the interesting things we're finding now is that we have some older adults who connect through online worship and even online Bible study, but uh, and but they don't want to come back to be an in-person kind of thing. So they might have done some volunteering in the past, but they're not doing that anymore. Okay. I don't know about the volunteering per se, but our, our church um, uh, pre-pandemic, we averaged about 80 people in worship and now we're averaging 40 to 50. Mm. Um, and it's, I don't know if it's all pandemic related. We have a lot of families who have children or youth in traveling sports in club sports. And, um, that was already a trend pre pandemic. Um, but we just seem to have more of them and, um, we just January through May were wiped out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeannie. So, uh, I was, uh, attending church online for, uh, much of the pandemic and until very recently. And I found that, um, 
even the, the even though the church was having in-person services, uh, that I felt a disconnect because I didn't know what was going on in the church. So we had worship service, but none of the, uh, you know, let's do this, let's do that, or, you know, this is the budget, or we need more money. None of that got filtered down to the people that are watching. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, uh, Carolyn. That's a good insight from that experience. Well, let me I say a couple of things. Was there someone else who wanted to speak? Tony has something to share. Thank you. Um, we joined our church during the pandemic um, once it was safe to go back, uh, mainly because I went through deconstruction, couldn't go back to my old church. Um, but I, knowing the past of the church, um, our choir is decimated. Um, we lost our pretty much our entire youth group, mainly because they, during that time, they grew up and went to college. And so um, we are in the process of rebuilding our children's program. Um, so we're, we're definitely affected. We have a, a labyrinth ministry um, and it's very difficult to get people to come in and, and do that once a month uh, and you know just participate in everything. Yeah, we can see that definitely. Yes. Wow, well, thank you, everybody. You can hear in these descriptions that it's just a very different scenario than it was two and a half years ago, that these changes were already in the water with the modern to postmodern shift that was going on and all the volatility, it was already there. The pandemic just took these and ramped them up and sped them up, accelerated the speed of change with these things. With the, with the angst related to volunteering, a couple other places where, where we observe it in churches is uh, nominating committees. <laughs> God help you if you have to serve on the nominating committee, because <laughs> many of them, many of them are saying, oh, what do we do? Because many churches did not adjust their structure. They've not adjust their menu of activities or their structure, they have the same committees and they need to fill those committees and have a name in the committee to serve in those committees. They have the same positions. They have everything's the same as before, but now they have half as many people who, so you can see the nominating committee, it's just a built-in dilemma for them right there. And then the other place we see it is with um, clergy and church staff and lay leaders that many of them caring about their church, are willing to step up and take on additional responsibility, believing and hoping this would be a short period of time. But you know how churches function. Once you get into a position, it's kind of hard to work your way out of one. It's much easier to take something on than to take something off. So with the exhaustion that you see in clergy, church staff, and lay leaders, this is part of that that they have taken on responsibilities to try to fill in the gap uh, with the lack of volunteers. So, so all this to say, I, this makes a pretty strong case for the need to reshape as churches. We've come to a critical time where it is a, a time of transition and change. And so we are hoping that those churches, that churches can be proactive that they can be proactive and choose to do something uh, to address the great reevaluation that is going on. Let me make one other statement, then we'll go back to the PowerPoint. I, I'm trying to get rid of the word volunteer when it comes to talking about churches. And instead, I would say it this way, uh, members volunteer while disciples serve. We in, in churches, we use that word disciple. We don't use it anywhere else. You know, in, in elsewhere, it's kind of an odd word. So we certainly don't use it in other organizations that we are members of. But other, other organizations we are members of, sometimes we volunteer to serve and sometimes we don't. Just depends on the year of what's going on. 
when it comes to being our identity is a disciple, it's a different scenario. You remember when the disciples were trying to learn, when Jesus was trying to teach them what it means to be a follower? That, that time in the Gospels when he got down on his knees and took a towel and took off their sandals and had the wash basin, and the symbol of being a disciple he, he demonstrated is the towel. That disciples are people who serve one another. This is who they are. This is what they do. So when our identity is a disciple, we don't have a question about whether we will serve or not. It's how we are going to serve. Uh, so the question for the fall season of the year won't be, will I serve? It's how am I going to serve this fall? I was with a uh, church staff. We were talking about this. Their nominating committee asked a fairly young man in their church to serve as an usher, and he declined. But he, what he said was, I am serving as the coach for my daughter's soccer team this fall, and I think I can have a greater impact for the God's movement in the world by serving as a soccer team coach this fall. So that's going to be my ministry for this fall. That's how I'm going to serve. So the nominating committee, they were like, well, you know, that's a pretty good <laughs> we, we'll take that because you're serving uh, as a disciple in our community. And sometimes you do that through the church. Sometimes you do that in a missional way through the community. But disciples, it's not a question about whether we will or not. It's just how are we going to do that for this season of time? I'm hoping more and more people in churches will take on that identity as a disciple of Jesus and our conversation can be around how are we serving at this point in time, rather than we're members who volunteer sometimes and sometimes we don't. So anyway, let's let's uh, pull up that PowerPoint there, Ursula, and we'll, um, we'll, we'll take another step here. So the great reevaluation is underway. Every church is experiencing it. Everybody's doing it. Tony mentioned she went through deconstruction She's not alone. This, this is a word we all recognize because that's another way to say this, the great reevaluation. Everybody's reevaluating everything. So, of course, they are doing that in their relationship with their churches, too. And I would say this is wonderful timing. Way before the pandemic came along, uh, we at Pinnacle, along with Central Seminary and many others, have been trying to encourage adaptive transformation for a long time. Some churches clued into that and believed, yeah, we do need to shift and change. Others, they just weren't ready for it. So I'm hoping that the pandemic and the volatility of the political divisiveness and you name it, all the, all the uh, volatility in our world has convinced more of us now this is a perfect timing for us to do, engage the great reevaluation in a proactive way and proactively look for how is God appearing in our world now? Where's God's presence? How is God's energy showing up? What's the guidance for us in our world? If, when we listen and we pay attention and we follow the Spirit's nudges, what's that look like? So I... Uh, the pandemic and the other volatility is presenting us a wonderful opportunity to become church as it is church that, that is becoming. And you see the first bullet on the screen. When we think about it, do we really want to return to church as we have known it before the pandemic? <laughs> For many, it was not going so great anyway before that. So we don't want to romanticize the past in a nostalgic way to take us back to something we wanted to move on from anyway. So the great reevaluation is underway. It's perfect timing for God's church. And then here are three pivot points. So the next slide, Ursel, mm -hmm. I, let me suggest some pivot points. What, what does a church need? in order to live into its mission more fully, becoming a more robust expression of church. 
I don't know how to do it without doing this first pivot. We, we need to get ourselves, we need to do whatever it takes to get ourselves to good space. Um, this past summer, I was able to do a renewal leave, uh, which is, was the first one in 59 years. Yay, I was able to do a renewal leave. So it was fantastic. It was only three and a half weeks long, but I had never had something like that before. It was so life-giving. And what I realized in stepping away for that period of time was I was spending a lot of time before trying to work up the energy for things, trying to make things happen, trying to generate enthusiasm that I didn't really have, trying to make it happen. And that's where, I, when I got reacquainted with Psalm 46, that maybe it's not our job to make things happen. Maybe it's not our role to generate spiritual energy. That instead, there is a savior for the world and for the church, but it's not us. Uh, the old joke that used to float around seminary eons ago when I was there was, I learned two things in seminary. One, there is a God. Number two, that's not me. So that idea that um, God provides the energy, God provides the flow, the current. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the people of God. We don't have to create that. That's not our job. Ours is to trust it and be willing to step into the flow of God's energy moving through this world and trust it will take us a good place, take our feet off the ground and give ourselves to the current. That's our role. So some of you know emotional intelligence, research in the work of Daniel Goleman and Richard Boyatzis and Annie McKee, and it's fantastic information. But they, they identified that leaders really influence the emotional tone of organizations. The mood and morale is another way to say that, the emotional tone, the climate, the emotional climate of an organization. And their research was so excellent, they got to the place where they determined uh, for every two points rise in the emotional climate of a workplace well, is how they identified it. For every two points rise on the scale they were using for mood and morale in the workplace, there was a one point rise in profits in that organization. So, of course, in organizations, businesses, corporations, they measure things differently than we do. So if profits is your measure, that's what they were looking for. They found every 1% rise in profits was linked with a 2% rise in mood and morale. And if we reflect on that briefly, it makes sense, doesn't it? That if, if when people are happier in the workplace, they're more productive. And so, of course, profits would go up because people are happier and they're enjoying their work and they're more productive. All this to say, leaders really influence the mood and morale in the workplace and in church. So think about lay leaders in congregations, church staff people, clergy, whatever their positions are. The way we are influences, has powerful influence. Many think they really don't have much influence, but I can tell you they dramatically do have influence on the life of the church. And let me give you one brief uh, example. A, a lot of what we're talking about right now is a mindset, it's an attitude, it's a perspective. I put the phrase church building in parentheses to remind me of this experience I had with a church in Georgia where I, it was an established first church of its denominations, the first Baptist church in a large city. They had had slow decline over a long period of time in this First Baptist Church. They had a beautiful building that's paid for, no debt at all, had a pastor, 
they had a group of committed people who are part of that church. But the mood and morale of the church was very low because all they could see, they were looking through the lens of who they used to be. The only thing they could see when they got together for activities was who was not there anymore or what they couldn't do anymore or the programs they had to discontinue because they didn't have the volunteers to serve in those programs. Uh, so this was their, of course, that would lead to a demoralizing atmosphere after a while, wouldn't it? If that's all you're looking at is what we used to do and how we can't do that now, of course, that's going to demoralize the group. So there was, there's a new church in that city that it started, and they don't own property. They, were, they had been meeting in a shopping center. Something happened to their lease. So they approached this First Baptist Church to ask them, could we lease some space in your church building? And so the pastor of that new church came over and met with the pastor of First Baptist plus a committee, a group of people. And so the group of people, they were walking this church planner around and showing the facility, uh, entering a discussion. It ended up that the new church uh, went somewhere else for reasons that were about the new church, not about this First Baptist. But that church planner made this comment while he was there. He said something like, you all must be walking on cloud nine all the time because you have such amazing resources here. You have this beautiful facility with no debt. You have no rent that you pay. You have no mortgage that you pay. You must be so excited about this fact that you have no debt. You have this core group of people who are mature Christ followers. They know what it means to tithe and to give to your church. They know something of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. They're not starting from zero like we are doing with this new church with people who've never been a part of this before. And we're having just to start at zero and from scratch. You must just have it made with your resources, with your people, with your rhythms that you have established. It's amazing what uh, I imagine you're on cloud nine all the time. So this was, these people heard this church planner make this comment and they went, oh, we hadn't really thought about that before. You know, they didn't make any comments to the church planner, but later in their discussion, when they were debriefing this, it was like a light bulb came on for them and they realized the way we see our church, the way we think about our church, our mindset, our attitudes, our form our experience. And maybe it's time for us to step out of the past into the present and look at the, the gifts and graces and assets and resources we have and ask, what can we do now, oh God, with the gifts that we have? Let's reshape into the church that we're called to be at this point in time. So. All this to say, for us as congregational leaders, everybody who is here is a leader in some way. It is time for us to do whatever we need to do, to take the time to work one day less a week or do whatever we have to do to get ourselves where we're in touch with the hope, the beautiful way of Jesus, and where it is a beautiful way to be in the world. We need to do that before we begin, before we lead adaptive change or reshaping church. All right. Um, second slide. I have two more and then I'll pause and we'll have some discussion about this. Pivots. First is get ourselves to good space. Secondly, clarify the why and the what. And so I would in invite us as leaders to do this personally, but then also to lead our congregations. And this is part of the reshaping church process. The why is what you would think it is because God loves us. God so loved the world that the incarnation happened and this brought new life to every one of us. So this is why. This is why we do what we do. The what I would suggest is transformation. That God calls us into this movement where we hope our churches are incubators of transformation, where they transform or ordinary indi individuals into reflections of Jesus Christ. We hope that we go in the way we are, but we come out different in church 
because we're being transformed. And we hope our churches themselves are being transformed into more robust expressions of the body of Christ. And then also, we want to participate with God's transformation of planet Earth, our communities where we are, that they, they have signs of the reign of God in them because of our church, the presence of our churches and our participation. So getting ourselves to good space, clarifying the why and the what. And I think I have one more slide about this one, Ursula. You do. I do. Let's just go ahead and put up all these descriptors. That's great. Uh, so here's why it's so important for churches to clarify this. If they don't clarify their why and what, most churches simply drift into unintentionally a mission of trying to keep as many people in their church happy as long as possible. <laughs> uh, they don't mean to do this. It's inadvertent. They just slip into it over a long period of time. But their de facto mission statement is, we want to keep as many people happy as long as possible so they will continue to give their funds and they'll participate in our activities and populate our church. You can hear it in the questions they ask in their church. Are we keeping people happy? Is everybody happy? Anybody uncomfortable? Anybody upset? Any problems to resolve? We don't want anybody to leave. So is everybody comfortable and happy? I didn't come up with this myself. It was from Gil Rendell in a book on conflict management at the Alban Institute. You remember the Alban Institute from a long time ago? They put out a book and a chapter in there. He mentions the happiness trap. And it, it would if that is the purpose of our church, it's never spoken. If it's the unspoken purpose of our church that we have drifted into, it will make us crazy after a while. Because have you ever tried to really make someone else happy? Happiness is an individual project that we can't do for anybody else. It's enough challenge to do it for ourselves. So to try to make someone else content or happy with their life is an impossible task. And if, if that is the purpose of our church, we are just putting out brush fires all the time. So instead, we want to invite ourselves towards transformation, where that is the purpose of our church. And then the questions we are asked are, how are we doing with participating with God's transformation of the world and our community and ourselves? How are we doing in participating with that? That's an invigorating call that many of us want to be a part of a community of faith that's focused on that kind of thing. So all this to say, this is why it is necessary for us to get clear on uh, the why and the what. And then the third pivot that we would invite churches into is equipping our leaders in our churches for maximizing this transformation opportunity. We want to invite the mindset, the viewpoint. We want to cultivate the viewpoint that this is a great opportunity. It's a perfect timing for us to transform as churches. And so let's not miss this open window that we have. At the same time, we recognize nobody's lived through this before. We have never come out of a pandemic before in our lifetimes. So if someone tells you, here's exactly how you do that, don't believe anything they say because they've not come through it either. They're making it up. If they tell you they're one, two, three, four, or here's the outline of how to do that. Nobody knows because nobody's done it before. What we do want to invite people is into is the creative space where we as leaders can learn what we need to learn as far as skills and competencies to lead adaptive change and to help our churches have a process that can help them move forward to discover uh, the emerging form of church that is theirs to pursue. We at Pentecostal and Central Seminary, we don't prescribe what the form is going to be. What we want to do is provide a structured process to help churches engage the questions they need to engage with support and with other churches so that they can discover this. All right, last slide I have, I think, is the next one here. In summary, the great reevaluation is underway. There ain't no stopping that train. It has left station. And 
is perfect timing for God's church. We needed to do this anyway, so let's do the work it takes to get ourselves to good space, clarify the why and the what, and Ursula, there's one more, which is uh, let's equip and empower our leaders and churches so that they can navigate these waters. Well, let's uh, take ourselves off of um, screen sharing so we can see each other for a moment. Covered a lot of ground uh, with, with this. Let me ask you, what are you thinking? What are you hearing? How's this relate to your ministry setting? Questions, observations, insights, just a chance to debrief what, what you're experiencing so far in, in what we've been talking about. I should have a much more focused question than that, but I don't. So this is a general. What are you, where are you going as you're hearing this? What are you experiencing? I will make a comment, Mark. I think that one of the significant things you said was that we were going back to where we were is not a good choice. But we were already, there were already uh, fissures in our structure, and the pressure of pandemic made that worse. So it's just like in your house, if you have a problem, you ignore it as long as you can, but then when the when the plumbing breaks or the air conditioning system goes down, then you take some action. And it may be a good time to update your plumbing or your air conditioning system. And so I think that's where we are right now. It's a great opportunity to examine ourselves and say, what do we do well? What do we need to do better? Where do we go from here? Yeah, and I wonder, anybody have an example of a church, and it could be yours or another one that you know about, of where you are seeing a forward-moving mindset and activity and where you think they are engaging the opportunity. And you'd say, this is, this is a sign that they're engaging the opportunities that are in embedded in this transformation opportunity. Um, anybody have an example? Well, I, I don't know if this is what um, you're thinking about or not, and I don't even know if our entire church is all right there or not, but um, I had started um, right before the pandemic myself, uh, going through a two-year program to become a spiritual director, mm -hmm. and so, um, and I just finished that last May, and um Along the way, you know, I talk about what I'm learning with people in the church. And so, and I would say probably most of the people in our church um, had never really known anything about spiritual direction. You know, the whole contemplative scene, they're like, what, what is that? Um, and it sounds new agey. Um, so, uh so we, you know, I've kind of been teaching them slowly about all of this. Um, but then when uh, in 2019, um, that's when Bruce first took this church and it's a near, it's a, his home church. We already had a home, so we didn't need the parsonage. So one of the things we've been trying to determine is how do we use this parsonage? And the pandemic put that on hold. But one thing that has come out from lots of just discussions and uh, talking with people in the community about what's needed, we came up with this idea of spiritual formation and counseling center. Mm -hmm. And we actually have a couple of therapists that are going to be providing counseling there. Um, I'll be doing spiritual direction there, but we've got lots of ideas for other kinds of uh, retreats, workshops, different things to go on there. And um, our church people are really getting excited about that. And we just, we finished, we just finished a renewal weekend where we had someone come and talk, not naming con contemplation because that's too scary, 
but telling about what that is, the hope. And um, our folks are getting excited about that. And we've opened that up to other people in the community. And then they also started this past summer, what we call the Leota Workshop Series, um, opening up to the community, different kinds of creative artistry kinds of things that people could be involved in. So it's, it's different wow. ways of reaching out in our community than what we've ever done before. Yeah, cool. Well, really great. And, um, and I tell people, and some of some of them, you know, our trustees are like, oh, good, this maybe we'll get people in here, you know, and they'll give more. And <laughs> we keep saying, that's not the point. <laughs> We're not right. going to worry about that. Maybe right. it will, maybe it won't. <laughs> yeah, it's a missional ministry and yeah. standalone in itself. Well, I was just thinking about, too, um, we have quite a few churches who have worked, who have been a part of the reshaping church community of practice. Uh, through Central Seminary, and we have a new group that's forming that will start in January, and I was thinking about some of the outcomes for some of those churches. Uh, one is a church in Charleston, South Carolina, who they have a young woman in their church who's musically gifted, and around them, there are lots of kids who, who are not able to financially afford uh, music lessons. Uh, they attend school and get whatever music training there is there, which is not as much as there used to be, uh, but they could never afford anything beyond that. So this church has secured some grant money, and this young woman in the church who's musically gifted, they have an after-school music training program now, and it's for people in their community, kids in their community, and it's going really well. I don't know if anybody has come to their church as a result of that. Again, JD, like you said, that's not the purpose of it, but they are, it, I can tell you, it has energized the church and they are all really excited about what's going on. Uh, two more brief examples. Uh, one church who, who during the pandemic, uh, their small group uh, ministries um, increased. They had more people participating in small group. They were not Sunday school classes, but they were online uh, book, book clubs, book studies, Bible studies, so on, so on. Now they have added a person to their church staff who that's their uh, area of focus is to cultivate small groups within their church because lots of people are hungry for connection, for relationship, and that's where formation often happens in these. I th think they're calling them life groups, perhaps but lots of different kinds of groups. And then one last one is um, a church who has uh, called an online missional strategist um, is the word they're using. Um, I don't think they, they use that wording uh, apart from their church. You know, it's kind of internal language, but it's a person who is not a communications director, but they are looking at the people meeting online as a real thing. And they have a person in their church who engages people in that way. They're looking at it as a place to engage people in a mission field. And so they are building that into the structure of their church. Well, I'm gonna, I'm going on and on because it's very exciting that when we can get ourselves to these good places into what's emerging, emerging church practice, we might say, there are all kinds of things we can discover and um, churches taking some new shapes and new forms. So uh, before our time slips away, though, let me hand it back over to Ursula Harrison. Yeah, and I want to take just a few minutes. and Thank you, Mark, for your presentation and everybody for your uh, participation and feedback. Let me say just a word about uh, reshaping church process and where now working to find churches that want to be involved in this process going forward in uh, 2023. Uh, so right now we're introducing Reshaping Church uh, through some preview events. There are three more of those uh, scheduled. You can find that on the uh, CB, uh, CBTS website. And then uh, we'll have a, a covenanting and orienting event for those churches participating starting in December. 
the reshaping church process is not people coming in and telling you how you ought to do things in your church. Uh, each church is assigned a coach, one of our pinnacle coaches, and then we also have several folks who have been trained uh, who are ethnic coaches. So uh, we have a uh, capability doing Spanish, Korean, and Burmese congregations as well. And uh, we launched this in the church uh, in uh, early in the year, and then the church puts together small groups over an eight-week period, and they use the reshape book that Mark wrote as the basis for our small group discussion. The real neat part of this is this is discussion and discernment time. This is an opportunity for people to listen to each other, to uh, to listen to the leadership of the Holy Spirit within their particular congregation and what the Spirit may be saying to individuals as well as groups within the congregation. And then these groups report out things that they're talking about uh, to a, a coordination team within the congregation, a team made up of uh, whoever the church wants, usually the pastor and lay leadership in the congregation. And then that group takes this information, comes up with a, uh, discerns some emerging shapes of ministry, some possibilities, comes up with a ministry uh, plan, ministry guide, and, and then uh, initiates that. And as we talk with congregations about developing a ministry plan, we're not talking about you know, one, two, three, five year kind of things. We're talking about what can make an impact in your community and in your congregation the next six months to a year and uh, encourage congregations to take advantage of those opportunities that are emerging right now. Uh, there is a fee for churches to be involved in this. It's a $500 fee. And for this, they have the opportunity to be part of the process. They have a coach that's dedicated to them during this period of time. They're also invited to be part of ongoing communities of practices with uh, other congregations to learn from them. And then they have the opportunity at the end of the process to make a request for a ministry grant of $5,000, which can be used to implement some of the things that they have dreamed about and uh, that they envision might happen as part of the ministry of their congregations. So many good things have come out of this. And uh, Part of it's been just the opportunity for people to sit down and talk to each other. We don't, one of the things that rarely happens in our congregations is to sit down and talk about things that are really meaningful to us. And so in the small group experience, uh, folks have the content from Reshape Book, but they respond to that, react to that, and talk about what they are learning through uh, what's happening within their congregations. So how did that work in different congregations? In various ways. Uh, this is not a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. God has placed every congregation where it is for a particular purpose, and that congregation is gifted in its own way. So if uh, your congregation is interested or you know a congregation that might be, uh, please put them in touch with, uh, with myself or with Jessica. Uh, there is information on the central website with some preview events. Preview events last about an hour. And uh, people have the opportunity to listen to a presentation by Mark and then have some discussion with uh, Jessica and Mark and I about how they might be involved in this particular process going forward. Um, you might not have, I, I'll give you a minute to see if you have any questions about that. And uh, we'll be glad to talk about that at any time with you. Any any questions or comments? Hey, Ursul. Yeah. Um, Carolyn is a member at, I believe, First Baptist Church Overland Park, right. and that was one of the churches that did reshape in 2022. So I just wondered if Carolyn was involved in that process at her church and if she had any feedback or anything that she'd like to share yeah, from please, doing that. Please. Uh, I was partially involved. Because it, during that time I was uh, isolating it in my house, um, and so I was involved in some of the early discussion, and then uh, our technology <laughs> broke down. Oh no! And so I wasn't really involved in in the end of it. One of the directions that we seem to be going, and I'm not actually I'm not in favor of is they want to redo the sanctuary. 
we are we are a first baptist church <laughs> that has no debt <laughs> Uh, and we are an elderly church, uh, partially elderly, but, um, and I, to me, I think that when I, I, I think about the energy that's going to go into, to uh, redesigning the energy and the money that's going to go into re redesigning, redesigning the sanctuary. And to me, it seems like we should be going in a different direction. Mm. But anyway, we're we're just we're in the process of discussing that now. Mm. I think I think my voice is kind of small, but <laughs> and your church is unique also in that it is a merger of two different congregations, and that just happened in the last what four or five years. It, 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 I'm not exactly sure how long it's been, but um, we were not completely merged before the pandemic, and so. Um, and then we've lost people, um, not necessarily because of the merger, but uh, we don't have a strong youth group and people with youth have moved to other churches. Sure. And, um, and of course, there's always other reasons that people leave. Right, right. But, so um, I'm not sure where we, where we are. Yeah. I think we, uh, I think we need to take some of the, uh, uh, things I heard, heard today about the where and the why mm. and maybe um, we've tried in the past to to integrate with our, our community but we've never really done that I mean we have that desire but it, it just doesn't happen <laughs> you know and this has been interesting how this has worked in different congregations uh, 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 that's one of the things that's come out of Overland Park one of the congregations we've worked with is uh, First Baptist Church in Waukesha, Wisconsin. And uh, going into pandemic, they were four congregations uh, worshiping under one roof. Uh, the uh, Euro-oriented congregation, and then I think Hispanic, Burmese, and uh, what was the, oh, Indian. Uh, Indian, yeah. India. And so uh, they've used this process to start thinking about how do we become a truly uh, multi-ethnic congregation? And uh, even with some language challenges, they've done the small group experience around uh, tables and talk with each other and come to know each other better uh, as a multi-ethnic group and came up with some ideas about how they can move forward in that way. Um, it's been interesting how this has worked in different settings. And uh, uh, I think that the neat thing here again is getting people the opportunity to talk to each other. Uh, the most effective ministries often come from the margins and uh, we need to give opportunity for folks to talk to each other and then have that time of discernment. So how it works out in, in each congregation is gonna be very different. And uh, that's one of, the, one of the joys and surprising of doing something like this an adaptive change process. And Angie, your church was involved in this uh, at one point. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. Um, I mean, it went through the whole process as far as I know. I mean, I led the small group experience um, part as, as part of that process, but then I um, uh, had some other commitments and, and wasn't really active on the leadership team after that. But um I would say from my perspective, and my perspective is unique since I was involved in this, this grant work from the beginning and kind of an insider before it was brought to my church. Um, my church didn't go as far as what I would have hoped, you know, they would have done with this opportunity. And I, I kind of feel like that about the church for the last two and a half years um, over the course of the pandemic that it was such an opportunity to try new things, um, to, um, you know, experiment. And largely our church only experimented with like form and function, not really with, you know, um, 
you know, exciting new ideas or, you know what I mean? Um, and a lot of the folks in the church have sort of patted themselves on the back because we've managed to change form or function, but, you know, uh, we don't really have new ministries that have launched or new focus areas. So, so I definitely would have, would have pushed, you know, would have liked to have seen the church push itself a little bit more, um, rather than, um, still to play it kind of safe, you know? Um, so, so that's been interesting, um, to, to observe. Well, I hope that, uh, if your church is looking to learn from what's happened in recent days that, uh, you share this with, uh, leadership, uh, possibility of being involved uh, in the coming year. Uh, it's been really great to see that uh, there are folks who have seen this as a teachable moment, as a transformational moment. And uh, we continue to provide that opportunity for them to engage in a process that will move the church, perhaps in some creative ways, or at least some more thoughtful ways of doing church uh, these days. Yeah. One, one thing I can say that uh, has happened as a result of the pandemic and having our uh, worship uh, put on Facebook is that we've gained some people through yeah. that. And we also have some previous members right. who live in different places that joined the service. And um, I think the problem is that sometimes technical <laughs> issues in involved. For instance, last Sunday, I, I didn't feel like going to church. I I said, I haven't stayed home recently. I'll stay home and watch on, on the Zoom. All right. But um, the volume of the speaker's uh, mic was so low that I couldn't hear the sermon at all. I heard the music. I heard the scripture. But then I had to make my own sermon. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I think one of the challenges is if we use new technology is that we have to uh, tune it to where it works. Otherwise, you know, people will come and watch it maybe one Sunday, but if they have the experience like I had, they're not going to come back. And so what, I think, yeah, and Carol, let me say one of the adjustments we made, and uh, this year was, we found that here again, a lot of churches were challenged by the technology, both in moving to online services and also doing. Uh, the on, a lot of these small groups were online, and uh, uh, Jessica Williams made it possible for churches to request money up front to uh, improve their technology. So that expense came out of the five thousand dollar potential grant. But we've had had a church that got a um, you know a camera that kind of rotates around in the middle of a. Uh, An owl. To, you know, <laughs> that's what they're called. I mean, it's a real deal. Yeah. Now, I would say that's the one thing that you know, my church was woefully behind technologically prior to the pandemic. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing, really, to think that, you know, they didn't really do anything at all online prior, did not stream services, you know, nothing. And so, I mean, we finally, you know, got to the point where that was possible and it was being done well. And thankfully, leadership decided that there was no turning back that we, you know, we have to continue to do this. Um, and I can say from a person who participates, um, I don't live in the same town as my church, so I'm not often actually there in person. Um, I was not involved in Sunday school prior to the pandemic. We'd only gone to that church for a year before the pandemic hit. And so we just had not, you know, got embedded in a Sunday school or a small group. But when the pandemic did happen, we immediately started going to Sunday school by Zoom because Sunday school shifted and that became a community for me and helped, you know, kind of keep some of the isolation at bay. Um, so I actually am more involved in Sunday school now than I am to worship just because it is that sort of, you know, it's more intimate and, you know, interactive and so forth um, from a from a not in-person, you know, sort of standpoint. So, 
So I am proud of my church for that. And, <laughs> and small groups in Sunday school continue to be um, moderated virtually like that. And they, and that's the way it'll be. So, so I think that's really good too. And we've had also, like you mentioned, um, past members that have relocated, um, you know, kind of reconnect and reestablish relationships and, and what so church, what church are you talking about? I go to First Baptist Lawrence. Okay. I thought that I go, yeah. I go to First Baptist Lawrence every now and then. Every now and then. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's one of the things we learned pretty quickly is I think the assumption of our leadership team was that the churches and church members were further along technologically than they than they are. And so that's part of the learning process as well and an opportunity uh, for us. Right. Well, thank you all for being part. Mark, you want to say a closing word before we uh, conclude our session today? Really appreciate you all being here and uh, blessings to you as you continue to join God's movement in this world. And I um, hope to meet you in person at some point along the way. Yeah. Mark, would you express a blessing for us as we leave? Yes. Let me use a benediction I like to use. Now, know that you are God's people. God's creative spirit brought you into this world and God's power sustains you to this very moment. So as you go, be who you are in Christ. Go as salt to flavor and preserve this world. Go as light to shine in the darkness and go as grace to bring healing and hope to a broken and hurting world. And may the peace of God that surpasses all comprehension guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Ursula. Janet, it's good to see you.